Chapter 7, Part 1 Of The Hill of Dreams by Arthur Mackin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hill of Dreams, Chapter 7, Part 1 It was very dark in the room. He seemed by slow degrees to awake from a long and heavy torpor, from an utter forgetfulness, and as he raised his eyes he could scarcely discern the pale whiteness of the paper on the desk before him. He remembered something of a gloomy winter afternoon, of driving rain, of gusty wind. He had fallen asleep over his work, no doubt, and the night had come down. He lay back in his chair, wondering whether it were late. His eyes were half closed, and he did not make the effort and rouse himself. He could hear the stormy noise of the wind, and the sound reminded him of the half-forgotten days. He thought of his boyhood and the old rectory, and the great elms that surrounded it. There was something pleasant in the consciousness that he was still half-dreaming. He knew he could wake up whenever he pleased, but for the moment he amused himself by the pretense that he was a little boy again, tired with his rambles and the keen air of the hills. He remembered how he would sometimes wake up in the dark at midnight, and listen sleepily for a moment to the rush of the wind straining and crying against the trees, and hear it beat upon the walls, and then he would fall to dreams again, happy in his warm, snug bed. The wind grew louder, and the windows rattled. He half opened his eyes and shut them again, determined to cherish that sensation of long ago. He felt tired and heavy with sleep. He imagined that he was exhausted by some effort, he had, perhaps, been writing furiously without rest. He could not recollect at the instant what the work had been. It would be delightful to read the pages when he had made up his mind to bestir himself. Surely that was the noise of boughs swaying and grinding in the wind. He remembered one night at home when such a sound had roused him suddenly from a deep, sweet sleep. There was a rushing and beating as of wings upon the air and a heavy, dreary noise, like thunder far away upon the mountain. He had got out of the bed and looked from behind the blind to see what was abroad. He remembered the strange sight he had seen, and he pretended it would be just the same if he cared to look out now. There were clouds flying awfully from before the moon, and a pale light that made the familiar land look strange and terrible. The blast of wind came with a great shriek, and the trees tossed and bowed and quivered. The wood was scourged and horrible, and the night air was ghastly with a confused tumult, and voices as of a host. A huge black cloud rolled across the heaven from the west, and covered up the moon, and there came a torrent of bitter, hissing rain. It was all a vivid picture to him as he sat in his chair, unwilling to wake. Even as he let his mind stray back to that night of the past years, the rain beat sharply on the window panes, and though there were no trees in the gray suburban street, he heard distinctly the crash of boughs. He wandered vaguely from thought to thought, groping indistinctly amongst memories, like a man trying to cross from door to door in a darkened, unfamiliar room. But no doubt, if he were to look out, by some magic the whole scene would be displayed before him. He would not see the curve of monotonous two-storied houses, with here and there a white blind, a patch of light, and shadows appearing and vanishing, not the rain plashing in the muddy road, not the amber of the gas lamp opposite, but the wild moonlight poured on the dearly loved country, far away the dim circle of the hills and woods, and beneath him the tossing trees about the lawn, and the wood heaving under the fury of the wind. He smiled to himself, amidst his lazy meditations, to think how real it seemed, and yet it was all far away, the scenery of an old play long-ended and forgotten. It was strange that, after all these years of trouble and work and change, he should be in any sense the same person as that little boy peeping out, half-frightened, from the rectory window. It was as if, looking in the glass, one should see a stranger, and yet know that the image was a true reflection. The memory of the old home recalled his father and mother to him, and he wondered whether his mother would come if he were to cry out suddenly. 
One night, on just such a night as this, when a great storm blew from the mountain, a tree had fallen with a crash and a bough had struck the roof, and he awoke in a fright, calling for his mother. She had come and had comforted him, soothing him to sleep, and now he shut his eyes, seeing her face shining in the uncertain flickering candlelight as she bent over his bed. He could not think she had died. The memory was but a part of the evil dreams that had come afterwards. He said to himself that he had fallen asleep and dreamed sorrow and agony, and he wished to forget all the things of trouble. He would return to happy days, to the beloved land, to the dear and friendly pass across the fields. There was the paper, white before him, and when he chose to stir, he would have the pleasure of reading his work. He could not quite recollect what he had been about, but he was somehow conscious that he had been successful and had brought some long labor to a worthy ending. Presently he would light the gas and enjoy the satisfaction that only the work could give him, but for the time he preferred to linger in the darkness and to think of himself as straying from stile to stile through the scented meadows, listening to the bright brook that sang to the alders. It was winter now, for he heard the rain and the wind, and the swaying of the trees. But in those old days how sweet the summer had been! The great hawthorn bush in blossom, like a white cloud upon the earth, had appeared to him in twilight. He had lingered in the enclosed valley to hear the nightingale, a voice swelling out from the rich gloom from the trees that grew around the well. The scent of the meadow sweet was blown to him across the bridge of years, and with it came the dream and the hope and the longing, and the afterglow red in the sky and the marvel of the earth. There was a quiet walk that he knew so well. One went up from a little green bry road, following an unnamed brooklet scarce a foot wide, but yet wandering like a river, gurgling over its pebbles, with its dwarf bushes shading the pouring water. One went through the meadow grass and came to the larch wood that grew from hill to hill across the stream and shone a brilliant tender green, and sent vague sweet spires to the flushing sky. Through the wood the path wound, turning and dipping, and beneath the brown fallen needles of last year were soft and thick, and the resinous cones gave out their odor as the warm night advanced, and the shadows darkened. It was quite still, but he stayed, and the faint song of the brooklet sounded like the echo of a river beyond the mountains. How strange it was to look into the wood, to see the tall straight stems rising, pillar-like, and then the dusk, uncertain, and then the blackness. So he came out from the larch wood, from the green cloud and the vague shadow, into the dearest of all hollows, shut in on one side by the larches, and before him by high violet walls of turf, like the slopes of a fort, with a clear line dark against the twilight sky, and a weird thorn-bush that grew large, mysterious on the summit, beneath the gleam of the evening star. And he retraced his wanderings in those deep old lanes that began from the common road and went away towards the unknown, climbing steep hills and piercing the woods of shadows, and dipping down into valleys that seemed virgin, unexplored, secret for the foot of man. He entered such a lane not knowing where it might bring him, hoping he had found the way to fairyland, to the woods beyond the world, to that vague territory that haunts all the dreams of a boy. He could not tell where he might be, for the high banks rose steep and the great hedges made a green vault above. Marvelous ferns grew rich and thick in the dark red earth, fastening their roots about the roots of hazel and beech and maple, clustering like the carven capitals of a cathedral pillar. Down, like a dark shaft, the lane dipped to the well of the hills, and came amongst the limestone rocks. He climbed the bank at last, and looked out into a country that seemed, for a moment, the land he sought, a mysterious realm with unfamiliar hills and valleys and fair plains all golden, and white houses radiant in the sunset light. And he thought of the steep hillsides where the bracken was like a wood, and of bare places where the west wing sang over the golden gorse, of still circles in mid-lake 
of the poisonous yew tree in the middle of the wood, shedding its crimson cups on the dank earth. How he lingered by certain black water pools hedged on every side by drooping witch elms and black stemmed alders, watching the faint waves widening to the banks as a leaf or a twig dropped from the trees and the whole air and wonder of the ancient forest came back to him. He had found his way to the river valley, to the long lovely hollow between the hills, and went up and up beneath the leaves in the warm hush of midsummer, glancing back now and again through the green valleys to the river winding in mystic esses beneath, passing hidden glens receiving the streams that rushed down the hillside, ice cold from the rock, passing the immemorial tumulus, the graves where the legionaries waited for the trumpet, the gray farmhouses sending the blue wreaths of wood smoke into the still air. He went higher and higher, till at last he entered the long passage of the Roman road, and from this, the ridge and summit of the wood, he saw the waves of green swell and dip and sink towards the marshy level and the gleaming yellow sea. He looked on the surging forest, and thought of the strange deserted city moldering into a petty village on its verge, of its encircling walls melting into the turf, of vestiges of an older temple which the earth had buried utterly. It was winter now, for he heard the wail of the wind, and a sudden gust drove the rain against the panes. But he thought of the bee's song in the clover, of the foxgloves in full blossom, of the wild roses, delicate, enchanting, swaying on a long stem above the hedge. He had been in strange places, he had known sorrow and desolation, and had grown gray and weary in the work of letters, but he lived again in the sweetness, in the clear bright air of early morning, when the sky was blue in June, and the mist rolled like a white sea in the valley. He laughed when he recollected that he had sometimes fancied himself unhappy in those days. In those days when he could be glad because the sun shone, because the wind blew fresh on the mountain. On those bright days he had been glad, looking at the fleeting and passing of the clouds upon the hills, and had gone up higher to the broad dome of the mountain, feeling that joy went up before him. He remembered how a boy he had dreamed of love of an adorable and ineffable mystery which transcended all longing and desire. The time had come when all the wonder of the earth seemed to prefigure this alone, when he found the symbol of the beloved in hill and wood and stream, and every flower and every dark pool discoursed a pure ecstasy. It was the longing for longing, the love of love, that had come to him when he awoke one morning just before the dawn, and for the first time felt the sharp thrill of passion. He tried in vain to express to himself the exquisite joys of innocent desire. Even now, after troubled years, in spite of some dark cloud that overshadowed the background of his thought, the sweetness of the boy's imagined pleasure came like a perfume into his reverie. It was no love of a woman, but the desire of womanhood, the eros of the unknown, that made the heart tremble. He hardly dreamed that such a love could ever be satisfied, that the thirst of beauty could be slaked. He shrank from all contact of actuality, not venturing so much as to imagine the inner place and sanctuary of the mysteries. It was enough for him to adore in the outer court, to know that within, in the sweet gloom, were the vision and the rapture, the altar and the sacrifice." He remembered, dimly, the passage of many heavy years since that time of hope and passion. But perhaps the vague shadow would pass away, and he could renew the boy's thoughts, the unformed fancies that were part of the bright day, of the wild roses in the hedgerow. All other things should be laid aside. He would let them trouble him no more after this winter night. He saw now that from the first he had allowed his imagination to bewilder him, to create a fantastic world in which he suffered, molding innocent forms into terror and dismay. Vividly he saw again the black circle of oaks, growing in a haggard ring upon the bastions of the Roman fort. The noise of the storm without grew louder. 
and he thought how the wind had come up the valley with the sound of a scream, how a great tree had ground its boughs together, shuddering before the violent blast. Clear and distinct, as if he were standing now in the lane, he saw the steep slopes surging from the valley, and the black crown of the oaks set against the flaming sky, against a blaze and glow of light, as if great furnace doors were opened. He saw the fire, as it were, smitten about the bastions, about the heaped mounds that guarded the fort, and the crooked evil boughs seemed to writhe in the blast of the flame that beat from heaven. Strangely, with the sight of the burning fort mingled the impression of a dim white shape floating up the dusk of the lane towards him, and he saw across the valley of years a girl's face, a momentary apparition that shone and vanished away. Then there was a memory of another day, of violent summer, of white farmhouse walls blazing in the sun, and a far call from the reapers in the cornfields. He had climbed the steep slope and penetrated the matted thicket and lay in the heat, alone on the soft short grass that grew within the fort. There was a cloud of madness, and confusion of broken dreams that had no meaning or clue, but only an indefinable horror and defilement. He had fallen asleep as he gazed at the knotted, fantastic boughs of the stunted brake about him, and when he woke he was ashamed, and fled away fearing that they would pursue him. He did not know who they were, but it seemed as if a woman's face watched him from between the matted boughs, and that she summoned to her side awful companions who had never grown old through all the ages. He looked up, it seemed, at a smiling face that bent over him, as he sat in the cool dark kitchen of the old farmhouse, and wondered why the sweetness of those red lips and the kindness of the eyes mingled with the nightmare in the fort, with the horrible Sabbath he had imagined as he lay sleeping on the hot soft turf. He had allowed these disturbed fancies, all this mad wreck of terror and shame that he had gathered in his mind, to trouble him for too long a time. Presently he would light up the room, and leave all the old darkness of his life behind him, and from henceforth he would walk in the day. He could still distinguish, though very vaguely, the pile of papers beside him, and he remembered now that he had finished a long task that afternoon before he fell asleep. He could not trouble himself to recollect the exact nature of the work, but he was sure that he had done well. In a few minutes, perhaps, he would strike a match and read the title, and amuse himself with his own forgetfulness. But the sight of the papers lying there in order made him think of his beginnings, of those first unhappy efforts which were so impossible and so hopeless. He saw himself bending over the table in the old familiar room, desperately scribbling and then laying down his pen, dismayed at the sad results on the page. It was late at night. His father had been long in bed, and the house was still. The fire was almost out, with only a dim glow here and there amongst the cinders, and the room was growing chilly. He rose at last from his work and looked out on a dim earth and a dark and cloudy sky. Night after night he had labored on, persevering in his effort, even through the cold sickness of despair, when every line was doomed as it was made. Now, with the consciousness that he knew at least the conditions of literature, and that many years of thought and practice had given him some sense of language, he found these early struggles both pathetic and astonishing. He could not understand how he had persevered so stubbornly, how he had had the heart to begin a fresh page when so many folios of blotted, painful effort lay torn, derided, impossible in their utter failure." It seemed to him that it must have been a miracle or an infernal possession, a species of madness that had driven him on, every day disappointed and every day hopeful. And yet there was a joyous side to the illusion. In these dry days that he lived in, when he had bought, by a long experience and by countless hours of misery, a knowledge of his limitations, of the vast gulf that yawned between the conception and the work, it was pleasant to think of a time when all things were possible, when the most splendid design seemed an affair of a few weeks. 
Now he had come to a frank acknowledgment. So far as he was concerned, he judged every book wholly impossible till the last line of it was written. And he had learnt patience, the art of sighing and putting the fine scheme away in the pigeonhole of what could never be. But to think of those days! Then one could plot out a book that should be more curious than Rabelais, and jot down the outlines of a romance to surpass Cervantes, and design Renaissance tragedies and volumes of Contes and comedies of the Restoration. Everything was to be done, and the masterpiece was always the rainbow cup a little way before him. He touched the manuscript on his desk, and the feeling of the pages seemed to restore all the papers that had been torn so long ago. It was the atmosphere of the silent room that returned, the light of the shaded candle falling on the abandoned leaves. This had been painfully excogitated while the snowstorm whirled about the lawn and filled the lanes. This was of the summer night, this of the harvest moon rising like a fire from the tithe barn on the hill. How well he remembered those half-dozen pages of which he had once been so proud. He had thought out the sentences one evening while he leaned on the footbridge and watched the brook swim across the road. Every word smelt of the meadow-sweet that grew thick upon the banks. Now, as he recalled the cadence and the phrase that seemed so charming, he saw again the ferns beneath the vaulted roots of the beech, and the green light of the glow-worm in the hedge. And in the west the mountains swelled to a great dome, and on the dome was a mound, the memorial of some forgotten race that grew dark and large against the red sky when the sun set. He had lingered below it in the solitude, amongst the winds, at evening, far away from home. And, oh, the labor and the vain efforts to make the form of it and the awe of it in prose, to write the hush of the vast hill, and the sadness of the world below sinking into the night, and the mystery, the suggestion of the rounded hillock, huge against the magic sky. He had tried to sing in words the music that the brook sang, and the sound of the October wind rustling through the brown bracken on the hill. How many pages he had covered in the effort to show a white winter world, a sun without warmth in a gray-blue sky, all the fields, all the land white and shining, in one high summit where the dark pines towered, still in the still afternoon, in the pale violet air. To win the secret of words, to make a phrase that would murmur of summer and the bee, to summon the wind into a sentence, to conjure the odor of the night into the surge and fall in harmony of a line. This was the tale of the long evenings, of the candle flame white upon the paper and the eager pen. He remembered that in some fantastic book he had seen a bar or two of music, and beneath the inscription that here was the musical expression of Westminster Abbey. His boyish effort seemed hardly less ambitious, and he no longer believed that language could present the melody and the awe and the loveliness of the earth. He had long known that he, at all events, would have to be content with a far approach, with a few broken notes that might suggest, perhaps, the magistral everlasting song of the hill and the streams. But in those far days the impossible was but a part of the wonderland that lay before him, of the world beyond the wood and the mountain. All was to be conquered, all was to be achieved. He had but to make the journey, and he would find the golden world and the golden word, and hear those songs that the sirens sang. He touched the manuscript. Whatever it was, it was the result of painful labor and disappointment, not of the old flush of hope, but it came of weary days of correction and recorrection. It might be good in its measure, but afterwards he would write no more for a time. He would go back again to the happy world of masterpieces, to the dreams of great and perfect books written in an ecstasy. Like a dark cloud from the sea came the memory of the attempt he had made, of the poor piteous history that had once embittered his life. He sighed and said, alas, thinking of his folly, of the hours when he was shaken with futile, miserable rage. 
Some silly person in London had made his manuscript more saleable, and had sold it without rendering an account of the profits, and for that he had been ready to curse humanity. Black, horrible, as the memory of a stormy day, the rage of his heart returned to his mind, and he covered his eyes, endeavoring to darken the picture of terror and hate that shone before him. He tried to drive it all out of his thought. It vexed him to remember these foolish trifles. The trick of a publisher, the small pomposities and malignancies of the country folk, the cruelty of a village boy, had inflamed him almost to the pitch of madness. His heart had burnt with fury, and when he looked up the sky was blotched and scarlet as if it rained blood. Indeed, he had almost believed that blood had rained upon him, and cold blood from a sacrifice in heaven. His face was wet and chill and dripping, and he had passed his hand across his forehead and looked at it. A red cloud had seemed to swell over the hill and grow great and come near to him. He was but an ace removed from raging madness. It had almost come to that. The drift and the breath of a scarlet cloud had well nigh touched him. It was strange that he had been so deeply troubled by such little things, and strange how, after all the years, he could still recall the anguish and rage and hate that shook his soul as with a spiritual tempest. The memory of all that evening was wild and troubled. He resolved that it should vex him no more, that now, for the last time, he would let himself be tormented by the past. In a few minutes he would rise to a new life, and forget all the storms that had gone over him. Curiously, every detail was distinct and clear in his brain. The figure of the doctor driving home, and the sound of the few words he had spoken, came to him in the darkness, through the noise of the storm and the pattering of the rain. Then he stood upon the ridge of the hill and saw the smoke drifting up from the ragged roofs of Carmen in the evening calm. He listened to the voices mounting thin and clear, in a weird tone, as if some outland folk were speaking in an unknown tongue of awful things. He saw the gathering darkness, the mystery of twilight changing the huddled squalid village into an unearthly city, into some dreadful Atlantis, inhabited by a ruined race. The mist falling fast, the gloom that seemed to issue from the black depths of the forest to advance palpably towards the walls, were shaped before him, and beneath the river wound snake-like about the town, swimming to the flood and glowing in its still pools like molten brass. And as the water mirrored the afterglow and sent ripples and gouts of blood against the shuddering reeds, there came suddenly the piercing trumpet call, the loud reiterated summons that rose and fell, that called and recalled, echoing through all the valley, crying to the dead as the last note rang. It summoned the legion from the river and the graves and the battlefield. The host floated up from the sea, the centuries swarmed about the eagles, the array was set for the last great battle behind the leaguer of the mist. He could imagine himself still wandering through the dim, unknown, terrible country, gazing affrighted at the hills and woods that seemed to have put on an unearthly shape, stumbling against the briars that caught his feet. He lost his way in a wild country, and the red light that blazed up from the furnace on the mountains only showed him a mysterious land, in which he strayed aghast, with the sense of doom weighing upon him. The dry mutter of the trees, the sound of an unseen brook, made him afraid as if the earth spoke of his sin, and presently he was fleeing through a desolate shadowy wood where a pale light flowed from the moldering stumps, a dream of light that shed a ghostly radiance. And then again the dark summit of the Roman fort, the black sheer height rising above the valley, and the moonfire streaming around the ring of oaks, glowing about the green bastions that guarded the thicket and the inner peace. The room in which he sat appeared the vision, the trouble of the wind and rain without was but illusion, the noise of the waves in the seashell. Passion and tears and adoration and the glories of the summer night returned, and the calm sweet face of the woman appeared, 
and he thrilled at the soft touch of her hand on his flesh. She shone as if she had floated down into the lane from the moon that swam between the films of cloud above the black circle of the oaks. She led him away from all terror and despair and hate, and gave herself to him with rapture, showing him love, kissing his tears away, pillowing his cheek upon her breast. His lips dwelt on her lips, his mouth upon the breath of her mouth, her arms were strained about him, and, oh, she charmed him with her voice, with sweet, kind words, as she offered her sacrifice. How her scented hair fell down and floated over his eyes, and there was a marvelous fire called the moon, and her lips were aflame, and her eyes shone like a light on the hills. All beautiful womanhood had come to him in the lane. Love had touched him in the dusk and had flown away, but he had seen the splendor and the glory, and his eyes had seen the enchanted light. Ave atque vale. The old words sounded in his ears like the ending of a chant, and he heard the music's close. Once only in his weary, hapless life, once the world had passed away, and he had known her, the dear, dear Annie, the symbol of all mystic womanhood. The heaviness of languor still oppressed him, holding him back amongst these old memories, so that he could not stir from his place. Oddly, there seemed something unaccustomed about the darkness of the room, as if the shadows he had summoned had changed the aspect of the walls. He was conscious that, on this night, he was not altogether himself. Fatigue and the weariness of sleep and the waking vision had perplexed him. He remembered how once or twice, when he was a little boy, startled by an uneasy dream, and had stared with a frightened gaze into nothingness, not knowing where he was, all trembling and breathing quick, till he touched the rail of his bed, and the familiar outlines of the looking-glass and the chiffonier began to glimmer out of the gloom. So now he touched the pile of manuscript and the desk at which he had worked so many hours, and felt reassured, though he smiled at himself, and he felt the old childish dread, the longing to cry out for someone to bring a candle and show him that he really was in his own room. He glanced up for an instant, expecting to see perhaps the glitter of the brass gas jet that was fixed on the wall, just beside his bureau, but it was too dark, and he could not rouse himself and make the effort that would drive the cloud and the muttering thoughts away. He leant back again, picturing the wet street without, the rain driving like fountain spray against the gas lamp, the shrilling of the wind on those waste places to the north. It was strange how in the brick and stucco desert, where no trees were, he all the time imagined the noise of tossing boughs, the grinding of boughs together. There was a great storm and tumult in this wilderness of London, and for the sound of the rain and the wind he could not hear the hum and jangle of the trams, and the jar and shriek of the garden gates as they opened and shut. But he could imagine his street, the rain-swept desolate curve of it, as it turned northward and beyond the empty suburban roads, the twinkling villa windows, the ruined field, the broken lane, and then yet another suburb rising, a solitary gas-lamp glimmering at a corner, and the plain tree lashing its boughs and driving great showers against the glass. It was wonderful to think of, for when these remote roads were ended one dipped down the hill into the open country, into the dim world beyond the glint of friendly fires. Tonight, how waste they were, these wet roads edged with red brick houses, with shrubs whipped by the wind against one another, against the paling and the wall. There the wind swayed the great elms scattered on the sidewalk, the remnants of the old stately fields, and beneath each tree was a pool of wet, and a torment of raindrops fell with every gust. And one passed through the red avenues, perhaps by a little settlement of flickering shops, and passed the last sentinel wavering lamp, and the road became a ragged lane, and the storm screamed from hedge to hedge across the open fields and then, beyond, one touched again upon a still remoter avant-garde of London, an island amidst the darkness, 
surrounded by its pale of twinkling, starry lights. He remembered his wanderings amongst these outposts of the town, and thought how desolate all their ways must be tonight. They were solitary in wet and wind, and only at long intervals someone pattered and hurried along them, bending his eyes down to escape the drift of rain. Within the villas, behind the close-drawn curtains, they drew about the fire, and wondered at the violence of the storm, listening for each great gust as it gathered far away and rocked the trees, and at last rushed with a huge shock against their walls as if it were the coming of the sea. He thought of himself walking, as he had often walked, from lamp to lamp on such a night, treasuring his lonely thoughts and weighing the hard task awaiting him in his room. Often in the evening, after a long day's labor, he had thrown down his pen in utter listlessness, feeling that he could struggle no more with ideas and words, and he had gone out into driving rain and darkness, seeking the word of the enigma as he tramped on and on beneath these outer battlements of London. Or, on some gray afternoon in March or November, he had sickened of the dull monotony and the stagnant life that he saw from his window, and had taken his design with him to the lonely places, halting now and again by a gate, and pausing in the shelter of a hedge, through which the austere wind shivered, while perhaps he dreamed of Sicily, or of sunlight on the Provençal olives. Often, as he strayed solitary from street to field and past the Syrian fig tree imprisoned in Britain, nailed to an ungenial wall, the solution of the puzzle became evident, and he laughed and hurried home, eager to make the page speak, to note the song he had heard on his way. Sometimes he had spent many hours treading this edge and brim of London, now lost amidst the dun fields, watching the bushes shaken by the wind and now looking down from a height whence he could see the dim waves of the town, and a barbaric water-tower rising from a hill, and the snuff-colored cloud of smoke that seemed to blown up from the streets into the sky. There were certain ways and places that he had cherished. He loved a great old common that stood on high ground, curtained about with ancient spacious houses of red brick, and their cedarn gardens and there was on the road that led to this common a space of ragged, uneven ground with a pool and a twisted oak. And here he had often stayed in autumn and looked across the mist and the valley at the great theater of the sunset, where a red cloud like a charging knight shone and conquered a purple dragon shape, and golden lances glittered in a field of fairy green. Or sometimes, when the unending prospect of trim, monotonous, modern streets had wearied him, he had found an immense refreshment in the discovery of a forgotten hamlet, left in a hollow while all new London pressed and surged on every side, threatening the rest of the red roofs with its vulgar growth. These little peaceful houses, huddled together beneath the shelter of trees, with their bulging leaded windows and uneven roofs, somehow brought back to him the sense of the country, and soothed him with the thought of the old farmhouses, white or gray, the homes of quiet lives, harbors where, perhaps, no tormenting thoughts ever broke in. For he had instinctively determined that there was neither rest nor health in all the arid waste of streets about him. It seemed as if in those dull rows of dwellings, in the prim new villas, red and white and staring, there must be a leaven working which transformed all to base vulgarity. Beneath the dull sad slates, behind the blistered doors, love turned to squalid intrigue, mirth to drunken clamor, and the mystery of life became a common thing. Religion was sought for in the greasy piety and flatulent oratory of the independent chapel the stuccoed nightmare of the Doric columns. Nothing fine, nothing rare, nothing exquisite, it seemed, could exist in the weltering suburban sea, in the habitations which had risen from the stench and slime of the brickfields. It was as if the sickening fumes that steamed from the burning bricks had been sublimed into these shape of houses, and those who lived in these gray places could also claim kinship with the putrid mud.' 
Hence he had delighted in the few remains of the past that he could find still surviving on the suburb's edge, in the grave old houses that stood apart from the road, in the moldering taverns of the eighteenth century, in the huddled hamlets that had preserved only the glow and the sunlight of all the years that had passed over them. It appeared to him that vulgarity and greasiness and squalor had come with a flood, that not only the good but also the evil in man's heart had been made common and ugly, that a sordid scum was mingled with all the springs of death as of life. It would be alike futile to search amongst these mean two-storied houses for a splendid sinner as for a splendid saint. The very vices of these people smelt of cabbage water and a pothouse vomit. And so he had often fled away from the serried maze that encircled him, seeking for the old and worn and significant as an antiquary looks for the fragments of the Roman temple amidst the modern shops. In some way the gusts of wind and the beating rain of the night reminded him of an old house that had often attracted him with a strange, indefinable curiosity. He had found it on a grim gray day in March, when he had gone out under a leaden-molded sky, cowering from a dry freezing wind that brought with it the gloom and the doom of a far, unhappy Siberian plains. More than ever that day the suburb had oppressed him, insignificant, detestable, repulsive to body and mind. It was the only hell that a vulgar age could conceive or make, an inferno created not by Dante, but by the jerry-builder. He had gone out to the north, and when he lifted up his eyes again he found that he had chanced to turn up by one of the little lanes that still strayed across the broken fields. He had never chosen this path before because the lane at its outlet was so wholly degraded and offensive littered with rusty tins and broken crockery, and hedged in with a paling fashioned out of scraps of wire, rotting timber, and bending worn-out rails. But on this day, by happy chance, he had fled from the high road by the first opening that offered, and he no longer groped his way amongst obscene refuse, sickened by the bloated bodies of dead dogs and fetid odors from unclean decay but the malpassage had become a peaceful winding lane, with warm shelter beneath its banks from the dismal wind. For a mile he had walked quietly, and then a turn in the road showed him a little glen or hollow, watered by such a tiny rushing brooklet as his own woods knew, and beyond, alas, the glaring foreguard of a new neighborhood. Raw red villas, semi-detached, and then a row of lamentable shops. But as he was about to turn back, in the hope of finding some other outlet, his attention was charmed by a small house that stood back a little from the road on his right hand. There had been a white gate, but the paint had long faded to gray and black, and the wood crumbled under the touch, and only moss marked out the lines of the drive. The iron railing round the lawn had fallen, and the poor flower-beds were choked with grass and a faded growth of weeds. But here and there a rose-bush lingered amidst suckers that had sprung grossly from the root, and on each side of the hall-door were box-trees, untrimmed, ragged, but still green. The slate roof was all stained and livid, blotched with the drippings of a great elm that stood at one corner of the neglected lawn, and marks of damp and decay were thick on the uneven walls, which had been washed yellow many years before. There was a porch of trellis-work before the door, and Lucian had seen it rock in the wind, swaying as if every gust must drive it down. There were two windows on the ground floor, one on each side of the door, and two above with a blind space where a central window had been blocked up. This poor and desolate house had fascinated him. Ancient and poor and fallen, disfigured by the slate roof and the yellow wash that had replaced the old mellow dipping tiles and warm red walls, and disfigured again by spots and patches of decay. It seemed as if its happy days were forever ended. To Lucian it appealed with a sense of doom and horror. 
the black streaks that crept upon the walls and the green drift upon the roof, appeared not so much the work of foul weather and dripping boughs, as the outward signs of evil working and creeping in the lives of those within. The stage seemed to him decked for doom, painted with the symbols of tragedy, and he wondered as he looked whether any one were so unhappy as to live there still. There were torn blinds in the windows, but he had asked himself who could be so brave as to sit in that room, darkened by the dreary box and listen of winter nights to the rain upon the window, and the moaning of wind against the tossing boughs that beat against the roof. He could not imagine that any chamber in such a house was habitable. Here the dead had lain, through the white blind the thin light had filtered on the rigid mouth, and still the floor must be wet with tears, and still that great rocking elm echoed the groaning and the sobs of those who watched. No doubt the damp was rising, and the odor of the earth filled the house, and made such as entered draw back, foreseeing the hour of death. Often the thought of this strange old house had haunted him. He had imagined the empty rooms where a heavy paper peeled from the walls and hung in dark strips, and he could not believe that a light ever shone from those windows that stared black and glittering on the neglected lawn. But tonight the wet and the storm seemed curiously to bring the image of the place before him, and as the wind sounded he thought how unhappy those must be, if any there were, who sat in the musty chambers by a flickering light, and listened to the elm-tree moaning and beating and weeping on the walls. And tonight was Saturday night, and there was about that phrase something that muttered of the condemned cell, of the agony of a doomed man. Ghastly to his eyes was the conception of anyone sitting in that room to the right of the door behind the larger box tree, where the wall was cracked above the window and smeared with a black stain in an ugly shape. He knew how foolish it had been in the first place to trouble his mind with such conceits of a dreary cottage on the outskirts of London. And it was more foolish now to meditate these things, fantasies, feigned forms, the issue of a sad mood and a bleak day of spring. For soon, in a few moments, he was to rise to a new life. He was but reckoning up the account of his past— and when the light came he was to think no more of sorrow and heaviness, of real or imagined terrors. He had stayed too long in London, and he would once more taste the breath of the hills and see the river winding in the long lovely valley. Ah, he would go home. Something like a thrill, the thrill of fear passed over him as he remembered that there was no way home. It was in the winter, a year and a half after his arrival in town, that he had suffered the loss of his father. He lay for many days prostrate, overwhelmed with sorrow and with the thought that now indeed he was utterly alone in the world. Miss Deacon was to live with another cousin in Yorkshire. The old home was at last ended and done. He felt sorry that he had not written more frequently to his father. There were things in his cousin's letters that had made his heart sore. "'Your poor father was always looking for your letters,' she wrote. "'They used to cheer him so much. "'He nearly broke down when you sent him that money last Christmas. "'He got it into his head that you were starving yourself to send it him. "'He was hoping so much that you would have come down this Christmas "'and kept asking me about the plum puddings months ago.' "'It was not only his father that had died, "'but with him the last strong link was broken, "'and the past life—' the days of his boyhood grew faint as a dream. With his father, his mother died again, and the long years died, the time of his innocence, the memory of affection. He was sorry that his letters had gone home so rarely. It hurt him to imagine his father looking out when the post came in the morning, and forced to be sad because there was nothing. But he had never thought that his father valued the few lines that he wrote, and, indeed, it was often difficult to know what to say. It would have been useless to write of those agonizing nights when the pen seemed an awkward and outlandish instrument, when every effort ended in shameful defeat. 
or of the happier hours, when at last wonder appeared and the line glowed, crowned, and exalted. To poor Mr. Taylor such tales would have seemed but trivial histories of some oriental game, like an odd story from a land where men have time for the infinitely little, and can seriously make a science of arranging blossoms in a jar, and discuss perfumes instead of politics. It would have been useless to write to the rectory of his only interest, and so he wrote seldom. And then he had been sorry, because he could never write again, and never see his home. He had wondered whether he would have gone down to the old place at Christmas, if his father had lived. It was curious how common things evoked the bitterest griefs, but his father's anxiety that the plum pudding should be good and ready for him had brought the tears into his eyes. He could hear him saying in a nervous voice that attempted to be cheerful, "'I suppose you'll be thinking of the Christmas pudding soon, Jane. You remember how fond Lucian used to be of plum pudding. I hope we shall see him this December.' No doubt poor Miss Deacon paled with rage at the suggestion that she should make Christmas pudding in July, and returned a sharp answer, but it was pathetic. The wind wailed, and the rain dashed and beat again and again upon the window. He imagined that all his thoughts of home, of the old rectory amongst the elms, had conjured into his mind the sound of the storm upon the trees, for to-night, very clearly, he heard the creaking of the boughs, the noise of boughs moaning and beating and weeping on the walls, and even a pattering of wet on wet earth, as if there were a shrub near the window that shook off the raindrops before the gust. That thrill, as it were a shudder of fear, passed over him again, and he knew not what had made him afraid. There were some dark shadow on his mind that saddened him. It seemed as if a vague memory of terrible days hung like a cloud over his thought, but it was all indefinite, perhaps the last grim and ragged edge of the melancholy rack that had swelled over his life and the bygone years. He shivered and tried to rouse himself and drive away the sense of dread and shame that seemed so real and so awful, and yet he could not grasp it. But the torpor of sleep the burden of the work that he had ended a few hours before, still weighed down his limb and bound his thoughts. He could scarcely believe that he had been busy at his desk a little while ago, and that just before the winter day closed it and the rain began to fall, he had laid down the pen with a sigh of relief and had slept in his chair. It was rather as if he had slumbered deeply through a long and weary night, as if an awful vision of flame and darkness and the worm that dieth not had come to him sleeping. But he would dwell no more on the darkness. He went back to the early days in London when he had said farewell to the hills and to the water pools, and had set to work in this little room in the dingy street. End of chapter 7, part 1